I live here in Calgary in the city. And I stayed at, started making fat skin uh, about four years ago when I was pregnant with my first. So I was, I've always been animal based, um, but I was keto, you know, Dave Asprey was my guru at the time and wellness mama. And I was looking for something to put on my belly. It was the fall. I was starting to get big. Couldn't find anything. I think I tried, the last thing I tried was that bio oil. It's kind of like in an orangey clear bottle. Anyways, it stank, it gave me a rash. <laughs> I threw it out and Wellness Mama was one of the podcasts that I was listening to. And she was kind of the first one that I was introduced to that was making things that you typically only thought that could be found at the drugstore, right? Because you would look at the products and they would have all these weird ingredients in them. And you'd be like, oh, I can't make this because it has all this weird stuff in it. And then you realize, well, I don't actually need any of that stuff in my product, so I can make it myself. So she had a tallow-based balm. And for some reason, I had some in my fridge. I used to get all my tallow from TK Ranch. They're a really great retail, easy grass-fed meat place to get it from. So I had some rendered. Um, I think she used shea butter. I had cacao butter because I was making my morning coffees with it. Also, if you give me a recipe, I will do everything in my uh, ability to make it not the same recipe because I cannot follow a recipe. So I had cacao and I had argan oil. I made it. It was great for my baby bump the whole time. The baby was born in December. It was all I put on her. We did a lot of massages at night. And I mean, you have a baby and you see that everything that goes on their hands immediately goes in their mouth. So I knew that I didn't have to worry about the argan oil, the cacao, the tallow going into her body. It was great. So it just seemed like it was perfect. If she had, she had a little bit of cradle cap, we put it on that just to sort of help that sebum sort of self-regulate the oil production. It was good. It kind of came back. I still haven't found a cure for cradle cap, but I knew that it was healing it and it eventually got rid of it. She never had eczema. But when she had diaper rashes, we just put that on too. There's a lot of products with zinc oxide. I just, I don't think there's a need for it. Usually a lot of that diaper rash is linked to food. I know for her, it was tomato soup, too much tomato soup in my breast milk and she'd have a little diaper rash. So you just slather some of the fat skin on and then give her body a break and it would go away by itself. Um, so I was making it for that. And then we tried it on my husband. We went down to the lake in the summer. He had some really bad cracked heels, which is also due to his diet and that kind of thing. Um, and this was really, it was really healing because it just, it's the same, tallow has almost the same composition as your skin. It's the fatty acid profile is almost identical. And that's what makes it so amazing is that it just, lets it gives your body sort of it helps it bridge that gap while it continues to heal on its own underneath um so we figured we had something we tried it on a couple friends who didn't really have any ailments let's say didn't really go anywhere everybody was like oh beef fat what weird but then we had friends who had psoriasis eczema babies pregnancy these were the people that started trying it and we were getting really amazing results. Um, tallow, in terms of mainstream, four years ago, I hadn't really heard too much about it. But also in that same breath, I thought that a homesteader was something that only existed two generations ago. I didn't realize, like, you know, these people were kind of in a separate niche that I wasn't aware of. I was very much a city person. Um, it was separate, so the idea of making my own thing was something a little bit foreign. So bringing it to these sort of downtown people, my market was a li little bit like, it was, it was sort of forging a little bit new ground, but we were having these amazing results and people were willing to try it because they had had psoriasis on their hands for the last 18 years. They had tried everything else and nothing was working. And finally they were getting results with this. And so we, I threw up a website, did some branding, that was fine. That was easy for me to do. I have a little bit of a background in that. And we just sort of started testing it on friends. It was mostly friends, probably for the first two years, it was mostly friends, um, word of mouth. And then I started to get more confident and I started to get a little bit more focused. So the first thing that I made and which is still the best thing and is the number one seller is the purist. So the other thing we did do when I finally launched it was 
I transitioned from argan to jojoba. So this is tallow. It's about 60 to 70% tallow. I really prize the tallow. So I always want to make it the most, the ingredient that there is the most of in most of the products. And then we have jojoba and cacao butter because I just, I'm addicted to the way it smells and it's amazing. It's a little bit tricky to work with if anybody's worked with it before, um, but I love it. So this is the best. This is still my favorite. And then the other one that we made at the same time was the fat stick. So I was looking for something that I'm not a lip gloss person. So, um, and I also found that I wanted something like when you put this on, it's commitment, right? You've got it on your hands, you're rubbing it in. It does disappear pretty quickly, not like a lotion that disappears into nothing. It, it's there, right? But it's not greasy. But with the stick, what I liked was that I could put it on my knuckles and then I could go and touch whatever I wanted and there wasn't an issue. So these were my two. So this one has no jojoba, but it does have some beeswax in it. So this is what I started using on my face, on my lips. Grab and go before you go out the door. I found in the winter, it was a really good protective layer just from frostbite, windburn, anytime if you're going out. I found it uh, worked really great. So these were my two favorites for sure. And they still are. Um, the next one that I made was the baby. And if you've tried any of my products, you'll notice that in the winter, everything gets a little bit harder. It's a little bit, it's really sensitive to temperature. So those few degrees that your house will change, that outside will change, that will affect it it really goes from soft to a little bit of a harder thing that you have to kind of scoop out a little bit. But I hope you'll notice that once you get it on your hands, it melts immediately because the melting temperature doesn't change. It's just the temperature of your house. So um, I made the baby. It just has a slightly higher jojoba ratio so that it's a little bit easier to get on. But really, if you have, you know, here sometimes they have the baby or the purist, so you can go with either one. Don't be distracted by the labels um, too much. But that was kind of the difference there. And maybe just to go back, the reason that we switched from argan to jojoba was I started learning about um, PUFAs, so polyunsaturated fatty acids. And we really felt like we, what we prized, there's still a big debate on those, what we prized are the saturated fats. So maybe I'll go back a step further. So the tallow that I use is only suet fat. So that means that it's only the fat that's right around the kidneys and the heart of the animal versus the rest of the fats. I've heard them called killing fats. I'm not sure. Different ranches kind of tend to call them different things. But if you hold it fresh in your hands, there's a noticeable difference. The suet fat is almost solid at room temperature versus the killing fats. They're much more, they're much softer because they're higher in polyunsaturated fatty acids versus the saturated fats are harder at room temperature. So saturated fats are gonna be, coconut oil is one of them, but all of your animal fats, butter, that kind of thing. Those are the ones that you wanna cook with, wanna use on your skin. Um, and then there's kind of in the middle ground. So jojoba is a bit of a, its own. It's a monosaturated, so it's like olive oil. Um, so olive oil you don't wanna cook with, but you wanna eat it cool usually so that it doesn't oxidize and jojoba is like that too. So it's a good, it's a good option to use in the middle. I don't use olive oil in my products because it doesn't personally work on my skin. I like to eat it, but I don't like to use it on my skin. And this is also the main driver of how I build my line. What do I need? What do I need? What does my family need? Uh, initially I was looking at other brands, seeing what they're doing. And I kind of got off track because I would follow kind of them and think that there was something there that I needed to do, but it didn't serve me any purpose. And it also didn't feel like something that I could stand behind. So I, when I'm creating, I definitely put my blinders on and I just go with what I need. So I'm pregnant a lot. This is the third one. So I have babe, kids and stuff. So it's a lot of family oriented stuff right now. Um, you'll see all my marketing is all well, it's all me right now because I don't like to have my kids on there, but it's, it's definitely women focused, but the branding has always been very unisex, I think. And I, something I have to work on. Anyways, I'll touch on that later. But so I get suet fat and 
I had originally only been buying from um, TK Ranch. They sell it rendered. It's great. If you want to try making your own, if you want to just get into tallow and you want to um, like minimize and figure out what actually works for your skin, just get it from TK Ranch. Um, initially, I was buying like 10, 20 things at a time from them and they, they didn't like that. So they limit it to, to four per person now. So I had to find another source. So I source most of it now from Trails and Beef. They're down in Nanton. They're lovely. So I get it from them all just chopped up and then I render it myself um, in my little factory. And it's great because I do like to control more of the process that way. And it's really interesting to see the different color fat, like depending on when the animal was harvested in the summer versus the winter. There's just always slight differences and it's kind of the beauty of working with a very natural product. Um, so that last year is when I started using Trails End and it took me a year to go through all of their cows. And then this year I started getting their new harvest in August and I've finished it in November. So <laughs> I've been looking for new partners. And initially I was looking at some of the bigger operations, but most of those, like there's, it's hard with, with fat because it's been sort of like regarded as a discard product for so long that butchers and ranchers, they don't even keep it. Like there are some, there are definitely some Hubbin farms. There are some um, farms that have educated like direct to consumer farms that have educated people that have been buying half cows and half cows for a long time. They're fine working with all of the meats and all the organs and all of the bones and they like the, the fat. So those ranches will either, will sell all of it because you also only get six pounds of suet fat per cow. So there's very little relatively. Um, so their customers will take it all or else they'll sell it all mixed, which is not what I'm looking for right now. Um, or else it just gets thrown out. And it's interesting when you start talking to them to find out how much power the butchers have like they really have to like beg for it. But also the part of it is that the ranchers aren't selling it. They're not valuing it or selling it at the same price as the, the meat. So I've, I've definitely started offering them more. Like I've missed the fall harvest for a lot of small ranchers, but I've offered more in the hopes of securing in, in that they'll go through that extra trouble next spring to save it, separate it for me, because it has equal value to the meat. It definitely does. I think so anyway. So, um, yeah, grass fed, grass finished. So that's what I'm really prizing right now. And that will never change. Um, cause you can see you've pro probably all you guys know this, but Weston A. Price, they did a, like, they did a study a while ago and they compared the PUFA and the saturated fat ratios of a grass-fed versus a grain-fed animal. And they found that there was almost no difference. But when you look at that study, they're not, they're not looking at the suet fat versus the killing fats, right? It's all together. And there is a note at the end of that paper that they wrote on it that said like they would hope in the future to go back and, and analyze that difference. But I think that was 2014. So they haven't done that. <laughs> so um, there is... I still believe that grass-fed to grass-finished is, is the best. It's how the animal should be raised. It's how the animal was raised. So I will always seek that out. Um, that's something I'm never gonna change. Even if you say that an animal, oh, it's been um, like conditioned to be grain-fed. I don't think that's a thing. That's like saying that people have been conditioned to be grain-fed as well. <laughs> like I don't, um, or with the standard American diet, I don't think that's a thing. I think the ideal diet is grass. So that's kind of a difficulty a little bit, but anyways, it's fun. So have fun sourcing some suits <laughs> and you'll find out how difficult it is, but <laughs> to definitely, to scale it, like small batch, great, easy, no problem. But the scaling is really kind of where I'm running into some headaches, but it's good, it's good. Um, if I, I do foresee going into, uh, into soaps a little bit and there, I would definitely play with using the killing fats because, or the polyunsat, the rest of the fats of the animal, because I do think there's a lot of value in it. And when it's has that chemical reaction with the lye, there's a lot of benefits you can get from the other fat 
the other fatty acids that are in there. So I do foresee using it for that, but in terms of pure skincare going on your skin, I only am going to be using the suet fat from grass finished animals. So yeah, 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 that will, and that will always be a thing because I think that's the best ingredient. Everything else you can kind of throw out. If you have fat, if you, if all you can get is suet tallow or even fat, bacon fat, doesn't matter, put it on your skin. I, I just think it's the best. I really do <laughs> use it for lip gloss, whatever. Um, all right, I just need to get a Phoenix. Um, exactly, and we're Northern. It's the best, it's what they had on hand. And I think we've forgotten that. And we think that Vaseline is better and it's not, <laughs> it's definitely not. Um, how long am I talking? Do I, am I missing any questions? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Sure. Um, you, when I first tried it, I think I just, I had gotten, no, what, Trails End is lovely. They're the best. They grind it up for me and it's, it's served to me on a platter. It's wonderful. So you just throw it in a slow cooker and you melt it down slowly. And the trick, there was a, there's a, there was a um, Broya, they make a bone broth. And he asked me about selling, because when you make bone broth, there's fat that comes to the top. And he's like, I have all this fat, like rendered fat. Do you want it? And I want to say yes, but I know because when you cook it, when you're cooking it, that's what gets that beef smell into the fat. So when you render it, you really want to watch it and cook it as low and slow as you can so that the meat doesn't start to cook because that's when you get that meat smell infused in the fat. So that's really the trick to doing that. I, I know that there's like talk about a wet and a dry render. And I thought that there was, um, there used to be a, a thing to that, but I get all my fat frozen. So even if I don't add water to it, it's essentially a wet render anyways. So I don't add water to it. Um, you can add salt to it and you can do it two to three times, however many times you want. But I also feel like the more times you render it, you're refining it. So you watch that yellow color. If you do it two or three times, you watch that yellow color come out of it. And I just, I can't help but wonder what else it's taking out of it. So um, I just do it two times. Everything's, it's a lot of straining and, um, and then you dry it for a while and that way any kind of extra water evaporates and you can see when you use it that there's nothing left to deal with. So, but there is some time, so I have to go home and render a bunch today actually. <laughs> um, it's just thawing right now, but yeah, it's a, it's a process, but it's good. And then you have your own. So it's very nice and very easy. Um, and there are some people, so a lot of my audience initially was people who knew about it, right? Beef tallow was nothing scary, but it was something that they couldn't find maybe in Canada. There's so many American brands that are offering it um, or else they were making it, they were already making it themselves, right? Which some of you are. And it's, but sometimes maybe they'll have kid, you won't have time. It is a process, there's a lot to it, um, but it is easy to make, but they'll try it. So the other people who are new to tallow, they'll try it. Maybe they'll try the whipped body butter on their face and sometimes it doesn't work for them. And they're like, oh, tallow doesn't work for me. I'm like, well, wait, wait, maybe try another brand because it's often, I've never actually had it be the tallow. It's the jojoba doesn't work for them. The squalane doesn't work for them. One of the, the other fats doesn't work for them. So maybe mango butter or, or cacao. And one of the things that I kind of learned along the way was that when I was first testing it, my family, even though there's four of us, is not a good um, like sample group because we all eat the same thing. We all have you know relatively the same habits. So I'm not getting any kind of wild cards out here. And as the brand has grown, it's been really eye-opening to me to see how different people with somewhat similar eating um, tendencies and habits really can react differently to different, to different products. And 
uh, I definitely, my first <laughs> instinct was a lot of victim blaming, but <laughs> then I realized, no, no, no. Okay. No, it's not, it's not them. <laughs> it's my stuff. Um, and you just have to sort of figure out, like talk them through it or talk yourself through it and figure out what, what the uh the actual issue is and that's why i only that's why i really like having only three to four ingredients in each one because you can really narrow it down and it's definitely that n equals one self-experimentation is absolute key in skincare and in all things i think and there's so much of this desire to blanket statement magic pill is the same for everybody this works for everybody it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't matter how similar you are how different you are there's always seems to be something a little bit different um so yeah if you only have three or four ingredients it's pretty easy to quickly figure out this doesn't work for me coconut oil on my face does not work for me olive oil doesn't work for me on my body, it's okay, but I cannot put it on my face. I can't use it as a makeup remover. This stuff I can use as a makeup remover. It's great. Um, oh, did I bring it? I think I had the other one. So the only other oil that I did use, I started, oh yeah, okay. So the labeling or the, not the branding. So the first one, I called it a whipped body butter, body butter because we were looking for a way to figure out how we could expand the brand and how we could grow into it. It was a, definitely a business decision. Um, and it's funny because it really, like labels are very important and what you call things are very important because they, they guide our thinking so much. And so it, I do find it a little bit limiting sometimes, but what we have now, so I finally reduced a, or introduced a face product and the main difference is that I did squalane in the face one, and then I have jojoba in the body one. So again, giving labels, jojoba is like a heavier oil versus squalane that's a much lighter oil, but those shouldn't have any kind of negativity attached to them. Like, don't think that jojoba isn't for your face just because it's a heavy oil. If it works better for you, then it works better for you. Um, and you, I think I try to, I don't know, impress upon people the idea that you should just try it. Just don't be carried away with whatever other people say and just try it for yourself. Um, so squalene is derived from olive oil. It's squalene when they extract it first, and then they hydrogenate it and they make squalene. So it's definitely the most processed oil that I use in my products. I do like it. It works for me right now. And it's been interesting because there are people with cystic acne. And the first one that came to me was like, oh, this works great for my acne. I love it. I was like, okay, squalane works amazing for acne. <laughs> and then, you know, two months later, you have somebody also with cystic acne. No, it's terrible. And then the jojoba works for them. So it's really, there's no one size fits all. And I can never seem to be like, this is always for this, except for eczema and psoriasis. It's always the purest. <laughs> um, we do have a couple so initially, the other ones to expand the line, I was using essential oils. It was new to me. I have never been, when I switched from, I don't know, normal products to this, I, I kind of went cold turkey with fragrance. I didn't really care about it. I got rid of it. It wasn't, um, I don't miss it in my um, laundry. I don't miss it in my soap. I don't miss it in anything. So we brought in some essential oils, just a little bit to offer options because we didn't have any other products. We just wanted to fill out our line a little bit. I only use 1% in essential oils in my products. I don't, I'm not educated enough on them to use them as a skin healing. They're there for scent for me. So, but if there's ever any kind of, um, skin ailments. That's why I always like the purest because I feel the best recommending it all the time. But yeah, so just 1%, we have like a lavender, bergamot, which I love, and then a eucalyptus as well. So just nice and light. Um, and then we have these scrubs. So the scrubs came into play because we started phasing out soap in my house at the same time because it was interesting because I had never shampooed my daughter's hair and I would put tallow in it and she looked like 
not good for a week. <laughs> and then, and then at the end of the week, you, it had all gone into her scalp and into her hair. And she had this lovely fluffy hair again. And it was so mind blowing and mind opening to see that, you know, if this, if the skin and the body is left to itself, you know, everything we do to it is, is only like getting in its own way, kind of. So we kind of got phased out our soaps and we were, my husband was using the scrub because he is not, he's a minimalist at heart. So it's not like he's going to get out of the shower and then apply some lotion and wait for it to dry and then go to work. That's not going to happen. So we did the scrub because I, um, we really like the idea of using honey. So the scrubs have honey in it. They have jojoba, they have tallow. So you're getting um, um, an enzymatic cleansing with the honey, right? A little bit of that. And then you're getting a mechanical physical scrub with your exfoliation with the sugar in there. I don't use um, coffee grains or walnut. I think they're just a little bit too abrasive. I like how the sugar dissolves when I'm using it in the shower. But then you're left with the tallow and the jojoba on your skin. So you can get out of the shower and you're good to go. Pat dry and you already have a nice layer. It's not too much to wear under clothes and it just couldn't kind of be easier. So we have a lime and a sugar, or sorry, um, eucalyptus in those. So that was kind of like our first initial line. And then we, so the kids were, I hadn't had my second yet, baby. The other journey that I was on at the same time, because this is how it drives the brand, was supplements. And I had been so a big supplement person my whole life. And I found this, I found Ray Pete and I found the pro-metabolic world um, right after my second kid. And it was like the complete opposite, right? It's like no, no vitamin D or it was it was kind of no supplements, but it was also, there was a lot of replacing of supplements, right? So you switch from um, no more omegas, no more vitamin D, no more zinc, no more whatever, all the ones that I took. It's like, don't take that, they're poison. Um, and then it was like, take Shilajit and take vitamin E and take, what are the other ones? Well, magnesium was still. So magnesium was still a staple. And so I definitely got a little bit freaked out because I felt like I'd been poisoning myself. Um, but I didn't want to jump to this other, like I kind of had burn, I had supplement burnout. So I didn't want to jump to the other one. But, and also like when you take a supplement, do you notice a difference? Like I had taken all these supplements my whole life without experiencing any benefit or negative effect from it. So why am I taking it if it's not serving me. And, and maybe there's not so many ways where it would be obvious, but that idea of just pairing back, introducing one at a time, seeing actually how it sort of, how you react to it in isolation, that kind of became the guiding factor for me. So we, magnesium seemed to be one that still cropped up and it seemed like basic. When you're stressed, it depletes it. When you go swimming in a chlorinated pool, it depletes it. When you eat bad food, when you drink alcohol, like everything. Magnesium just seemed to be the one, okay, I can't get it from food very much. D, I can get from food, I can get from fat, I can get from the sun, but I need magnesium to process D. So it just seemed to be one where it felt, I felt secure and confident in still needing to bring that into my supplements. So we had the bait, we had the kids and I didn't want to give her oral supplements. The oral vitamin D freaked me out. I was like, I don't want to put, that baby's only getting breast milk. I don't want to put anything else in its, her mouth and mess up whatever else. Um, but we thought we would try a topical magnesium. It was still the winter. Um, so we got it, we made some stuff because if you're doing a bath, you kind of have to be in there for 20 minutes. and like a six month, six month old isn't going to sit in the bath for 20 minutes to soak in some flakes. So plus the water tastes really bad if you do a magnesium bath. So that was a little bit off putting. So we tried making a magnesium and that was about the fall. And it just was amazing. Um, so this is just, okay. If you see a magnesium oil, it's a bit of a misnomer because magnesium oil is just water and 
magnesium chloride flakes, right? So I had had the sprays, I had the ancient mineral, minerals ones, but I hated putting it on because you have to like put it on before bed. So you, you're all warm and then you just you have, you know, shorts on or whatever, and you're spraying yourself with this cold spray and then you have to let it dry and it gets all over your bed sheet. And it's just kind of an uncomfortable experience. And then you wake up and your skin is dry and it's flaky and it's yucky, gross. So I wanted a better alternative. So we figured that we would make um, a lotion. I didn't see any magnesium tallow bombs on the market. So it just seemed like it was a no brainer to try it ourselves. And it was great because there's, so there's um, distilled water in here. I always use distilled with the magnesium chloride flakes. So the distilled water is at the end. If you see the ingredients, you guys know ingredients, you know that it's listed in order of how much there is, right? It's not the order of how you do it. So you make the brine first with the magnesium chloride and then the water, and then you mix it with the rest. Because there's water in there, we use beeswax as the emulsifier. So that keeps it more stable and you get kind of a nice, I like the texture of the magnesium. It's definitely the most consistent regardless of what the temperature is. Uh, and then we have a hoba in there and that is it with the tallow, obviously. So we were initially, if you look at all the blogs and stuff, everybody's like, oh, put it on your feet. That's the best spot to take it in. But if you look at an adult foot and you look at a baby foot, an adult foot is like calloused and thick. Like there is a hard, there is a hard layer on there. So um, we started trying to read more. And when I see me, I mean, or we, I mean, myself and my husband, he's a bit of my researcher. Um, great, it's great to put on baby feet, that thin skin that it's, you know, it's super permeable, I guess. Um, but adults, thinner skin, back of the legs, underarms, great places to put it on. So it's funny how with different blogs, the stuff gets regurgitated, but then you have to go back and actually figure out, well, why or what is it? And then you realize the truth is slightly, slightly different. But anyway, so we started putting it on our armpits and the back of our legs. And then we discovered how amazing it is as a deodorant. Um, magnesium is an amazing deodorant. And I still haven't figured out exactly how to explain it or why, but I think it's just the simple fact. So if you're, okay, if you put on some magnesium and it's itchy, what we've discovered is it means you're deficient. And it can be locally, but it really kind of means you're deficient. So you'll notice, even if you're using a product, whatever, you're using the spray, you may notice throughout the course of your months that you'll have different times where it's a little bit itchy. And you need to think about what's been happening in that time. Are you more stressed? Are you, is it Christmas? Are you drinking more? Are you, are you doing any of the things that are depleting your, your levels, right? So they're all, it's all connected. So if you are depleted and it is itchy, usually what I say, don't, you can put more on if you want to, but I usually I do take an oral magnesium still. Um, I do mag by carb because um, it's not really fun to put on a lotion that makes it itchy. So I usually suggest that personally. But anyways, we're using it as deodorant. So the reason that you smell or that you sweat more is typically because your system is processing all these things that you've maybe overloaded it with or it's having a little bit of difficulty processing all this. And if you add magnesium, it makes everything work just a little bit better, right? It can do its job easier. So you're going to stink less. It gets rid of the smell because you have more magnesium and you're going to sweat less because your body is more regulated and it's just processed. It's doing its job a lot easier. So it's, it's not like a topical deodorant that's masking a smell that's physically stopping you from sweating like aluminum. Um, this is just making your body work better. It's just supporting it. It's a topical supplement. Um, some people, depending on where you're at with your healing journey, there have been some people who get a little bit of a rash on their armpits. So usually I'm kind of on the fence with that. Is it Herxheimer's response or when you have like a um, like a healing response to something, right? You try a new something and you're like, 
terrible reactions, terrible symptoms. And some people are like, oh, it's healing, like push through it. And I don't, I don't know how I feel. It's because it's so individual. It's how many other things are you dealing with at that time, right? And like, so I, I usually just recommend if you get a rash to stop, you can still use the product on your legs somewhere else, but your armpits, they're a pretty sensitive spot. So um, you can use it, yeah, on your legs when you go in a chlorinated pool, that kind of, I've been trying to think of the word all day and I can't think of it. Anyways, it lowers your magnesium levels. You can apply it after that to your legs, to your body, wherever. Supplemental magnesium, topical magnesium. It's amazing. It's, it's just a really great, a really safe way to take it on in. You're not going to get any GI discomfort if you overdose on it. You really can't overdose on it. Your body's just going to take it, process it, whatever it doesn't need, gets rid of it. But yeah, if you do get a little rash, take a break. I did have one lady, she was pregnant, got a rash, stopped. Next summer, she tried it again and it was great. So it could be hormonal. It could just be that. I used to really like the um, activated charcoal mask. That's actually all I did for a long time because I got rid of deodorant. I wasn't work. I was working. I was at home. So it was fine. It was an easy trial for me to make my poor family. But, but also you notice, you know, when you smell more, right? Like you're, if you're uh, a woman and you're on your period, like periods of stress, there's, you can notice it. If you start to tune into these symptoms, you know, what's happening you know what's happening. Um, so I don't know where I was going with that. Anyways. Okay. Um, difference between eczema and psoriasis. Not really. Um, between what I would recommend, it's usually the purest. And the other part of it is, is that I don't know where you guys are at, but symptom chasing, like root cause that term wasn't really too much in my vocabulary before the last two years. And now it seems like everywhere I turn that, that is always the message it's root cause. Right. And so by the time you actually get a symptom showing up on the surface of your skin, your body's been trying to deal with it and trying to heal it. And because your body's always healing. I believe that I believe your body's always healing. It only wants to survive. It only wants to stay alive. And by the time it shows up and you see it, you've probably already missed a lot of other signs that it's been showing you or trying to show you along the way. And we, we chase these symptoms. I have a bad hand right now that I'm dealing with. <laughs> um, we chase these symptoms. And there was a lady once and she was like, oh, I have, you know, I've tried every other natural product. I haven't tried tallow yet, but the only thing that ever works is topical steroids on my eczema. And it's like, well, you don't have a topical steroid deficiency. You have you know, a good fats deficiency. And so the other part of it is, I think I say that a lot, but the other part of it is it's never just about skincare, right? So the root cause, and it's hard to have these conversations with people that come because it's a lot like who aren't light seller people because it's, it's a lot, you know, um, to say, okay, well, but what do you eat? What are you eating? What are you doing on a daily basis? Because they don't want that. They want, what can I buy? What can I buy from you? And it always feels weird because that's not the type of person I am. Um, it's like, okay, well, what are you eating? And how can you fix this? And yada, yada, yada. And um, it's, it's that. It's, I think that's the other thing that the last two years has taught me that goes with skincare. And I think that's why I keep it so simple is because what you eat is going to have the biggest effect on your health your whole life, right? Genetics. It's not genetics. It's not what you were born into. It's what your parents ate. It's what you were fed growing up. It's what you eat. It's your habits. It's not genetics. It's these other things. And there's, it's such a like reductionist way to look at it. Oh, it's just the, you know, card I was dealt. No, no, it's what you do on a daily basis. So the skincare I really see as, um, it's, it bridges the gap. So while you work on healing everything else, which is going to take time, because if something's showing up on your skin, even though you just finally saw that symptom, it didn't just show up. It's taken the last six months, the last year, the last three years to finally come to the surface. And your body's like, okay, can you see this now? You need to do something about it. So 
the skincare is really just bridging the gap. It's giving you something that your skin recognizes because it's almost the same as your natural skin with that tallow while you also work on healing it in the background, whether that's reducing your stress, changing your diet, like all of these things. What's that, what's that quote? The person who, um, you're never gonna heal if you're not willing to give up what made you sick in the first place. Um, you know, it's that, it's that kind of idea and figuring out what is unique to you. So anyways, difference between what I'd recommend for eczema and psoriasis? No, because I would recommend a diet change. I'd recommend that vitamin E. So there's lots of vitamin E in jojoba. So making sure you're getting that in your diet. I haven't figured out the best supplement for that yet. I kind of like the one from Lifeblood that is in olive oil, but it usually kind of upsets my stomach. So foods with vitamin E is kind of like where I like to go with that. And then all your eggs, your meat, just get all that processed stuff out. Just get it away. Um, and then the time, the time, just, you have to invest the time to, um, to heal it. And magnesium is really good for it. Magnesium is a brine. Even if it's in here, do not put it on a rash. Do not, do not put it on a rash or broken skin. It will sting like a brine. Um, so even though eczema and psoriasis sort of says that you need more magnesium, put it elsewhere on your body, have a bath take an ingestible supplement, um, but don't put it right on there because that'll, that'll sting. So just put like a purist, something really clean, basic. If olive oil works for you, then olive oil works for you. Um, whatever works, just put that on. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can make all this yourself. You know that. Everybody knows that. You can make it all yourself. Um, I like to make it. So. Well, fair, which is funny because it's, um, I was going to call it like good stuff or something. And my husband told me I was retarded. So, um, we, <laughs> sorry, um, that wasn't a very good one. And I was just doodling one day and we found that and there were no, the website was a bit, I had already gone through trying to do like a t-shirt business and failed with some trademarking and stuff anyways. So we wanted to find a word. It didn't exist. Nobody was going to touch it. I could get the .com domain. These were all the other things that were important to me. <laughs> so in terms of branding. So my goal with the brand, um, I want to keep it like, it will always be driven by what my family needs, but I also want to take it to the masses. Like I'd like to make this, I'm trying, you know, I want, I want the, <laughs> the normal people <laughs> To, I want everybody wearing B fat. I don't care. Okay, sorry. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, this isn't a niche product. This isn't a niche product. It's for everybody. We should all be using it, and it's only going to benefit us. And um, if you're vegan, I'm sorry, but this is the best. So, how much time do I have? I thought I could only go for. Oh, okay. Do you want me to stop? Okay. Also, kind of that tallow is the best it's the most skin. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, just get tallow and TK Ranch. You can get it by the half kilo. Um, they deliver to Calgary. Get lots of other. I like the bacon from there. I mean, they have all the great products, but yeah, TK Ranch is the easiest. Um, I don't know who else sells it. Like, community might have some, or uh, just get it rendered and it doesn't matter. Like, don't worry about whether or not it's the suet fat or the, the rest of the fats, it's all great. It's all good. Um, that's just how I like to do it, but it's all good. It's not going to hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. It's when you cook it, it's how you render it. Yeah. So as long as you're not cooking, you have to watch it when you cook it and make sure you don't, um, because when it's, chopped up there's inevitably little bits of meat and stuff that's still in it so when you cook it so actually when I cook it everything all the meat that I collect off the top I give it to my friend who has chickens and she feeds it to her chickens so we kind of really get to use all of it which is I want some of my own chickens I have some healthy chickens but anyways um yeah and so you just have to make sure that you strain it right then you don't want that meat to get cooked so yeah yeah all right. Well, thanks, David. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have some sample, like, what have you been using the 
a shot. Okay. Kind of like, you know, try it out, put it on your skin. Like you say, it goes in really well. It's good yeah. for this time of year.